Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to today's, today's press conference here at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. I'm Anthony Rowley, a former president of the club, and it's my sincere pleasure, as well as privilege, to act as moderator today and to introduce our guest speaker, who is, of course, former Prime Minister of Malaysia, Dr. Mahathir bin Mohamed. Uh, Dr. Mahathir was Prime Minister of Malaysia from 1981 to 2003, long time, and then again from 2018 to 2020. He's one of Asia's most prominent veteran politicians and is also a well-known face at the FCCJ here where he's given us stimulating and sometimes provocative addresses on a number of occasions in the past. Today he's going to share with us his vision of what a new model of government might look like. And I think few people will disagree that a new model is desirable or even essential for our very survival and given the fractured and fractious state of global governance at the moment and of the world political order. Um, I mean, needless to say, it's you know, conflict and um, political conflict, ideological, strategic and economic conflict is everywhere, it seems. The world population has reached some 8 billion people and as Dr. And Dr. Mahathir believes that existing models of government with power concentrated in a handful of wealthy countries is flawed. Despite the fact that he's now 97 years of age, Dr. Mahathir is obviously not content with a quiet retirement or retreat from public life. He continues to exercise political leadership with the added perspective that only experience and maturity can provide. And he, when I asked him in the anteroom about how he manages to remain so healthy, he said it's a question of um, exercise, physical and, um, and intellectual exercise, um, but not in excess, in moderation. <laughs> so let me, let me stop here and let me, let's listen to and learn from what our guest has to say uh, today. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome, and as usual, can I ask anyone who has a mobile phone to turn it onto manner mode or switch it off? So, let Dr. Mahathir. Thank you. <clears throat> Firstly, Mr. Mod moderator, members of the press, I would like to explain that I'm not um, giving the views of the present government of Malaysia. I'm not in the government. In fact, I'm quite opposed to the government. So my views are my own views, and perhaps uh, some people who agree with me, but uh, it's not the view of the government. Now, what I would like to say is that uh, it was mentioned just now that the population of the world has increased to 8 billion. This number of people has created problem because we have not learned how to manage big population. That is why today we see governments being challenged everywhere. Before, governments could rule the country without any opposition, almost, even if they were not dictatorships. But today, whatever the government may decide, the people may take to the streets and oppose the government, and the government finds it difficult to carry out what it plans, and it has to modify according to the wishes of the, the people who are demonstrating. And of course, the demonstration, street demonstration can escalate uh, to become uh, even uh, opposition, uh, violent operation to the government, leading up to even civil wars. So governments today, they have not learned how to deal with big numbers of people. People, one million people taking to the streets is very challenging for governments. And governments cannot just do what it thinks it should do. It has to respond to the opposition. At the same time, because of the big numbers of people and the ease of travel, the por porosity of borders, the ease of travel has uh, resulted in huge migration of people. Today, Europe is no longer the land of the white people 
we have many, many people from Arab countries, from um, Black uh, Africa, and the like. And in future, most countries will be like Malaysia. Malaysia is a multiracial country. We have three different ethnic groups. We have the indigenous Malays, we have the Chinese who migrated to Malaysia long ago, we have the Indians who were brought in to Malaysia by the British during the colonial days. So Malaysia is multiracial, but most countries will be multiracial in the future. In fact, it, it, it is already multiracial. You see millions of people migrating to Europe from Arab countries and from African countries and also from Asian countries. So dealing with uh, multiracial population uh, is quite challenging, quite difficult. And if you do not know how to handle, then you are going to fa be faced with problem. And of course, the migration is usually from the poor to the rich. The poor see the rich countries more stable, more prosperous, more, oppor more opportunities for doing business, more opportunities for getting employed. So the migration is from the poor to the rich. And this, of course, creates problem for the rich countries. On the other hand, modern morals say, says that you cannot be too restrictive in governing the movements of people. So we have now a world where people are very mixed throughout the world. All the countries in the world will have mixed population and they will have a lot of problems. Now this population increase um, has not resulted in um, a more unified uh, governance of the world. Uh, we have the United Nations, of course, but that United Nations is controlled by five countries which have been given uh, veto powers. It's not democratic at all. What we need today is that some form of governance of the world. This is because the whole world now faces similar problems, common problems. And these common problems cannot be dealt with by individual countries. For example, we have the problem of the pandemic, COVID-19. It affects the whole world, rich or poor, wherever they are, whether temperate or equatorial, or even cold countries, they are all affected by this pandemic, caused by this virus. But we find that each country is trying to deal with the problem by itself without thinking about other countries. For example, the rich have access to vaccine, but the poor have no vaccine. But the unfortunate thing is that even if the rich have the vaccine, the infection can cross over from poor countries to rich countries, partly because of the movement of people that I mentioned just now. So, we are basically one world. We are faced not only with the pandemic, but we are also faced with a lot of uh, a uh, political problem, economic problem. Uh, for example, if you apply sanction to one country, the rest of the world will feel it. We are now feeling the effects of the war between Russia and Ukraine. We have no no wish to fight against anyone. We, want, we are neutral, we want to be friends with everyone. But nevertheless, the decision made against, uh, 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 to, the, to apply sanction to Russia has affected the economy of Malaysia and of many other countries. So there is a need for us to see, to see how we deal with common problems. Of course, COVID-19 is another common problem. Uh, then there is, of, of course, uh, the, the attempt to politicize almost every issue. Uh, there are countries which uh, uh, plan to have regime change so that all governments uh, comply with the, country, the powerful countries' uh, policies. 
Uh, all these things are common problem, including, of course, the increase in the population. Uh, it is good to be healthy, but we have the problem of uh, the increases in the number of population. And the increase is not uniform. We find that more, there is a greater increase in population among the poor countries, which cannot afford it, than among the rich countries. In one country, for example, there is re zero growth. They, they have no, uh, their young people do not wish to have any children. And that will affect the population balance between the rich and the poor. The rich countries will shrink, will have less and less people, and the poor countries which have more and more people, and of course, more and more problem. And when they have this problem, their, their one simple solution is to migrate. Migrate to the rich countries, to the stable countries, to the prosperous countries. So that is a world problem. It is not a problem of Europe alone, neither is it a problem of any single country. It's a problem for the world. Malaysia has got seven million foreign workers, foreign foreigners in the country. The total population of Malaysia is only 33,000, uh, 7, 7, 33 million. And seven million is a big number. So we have to learn how to deal with migration as much as Europe has to learn how to deal with this massive migration uh, that it is experiencing now. Uh, before, of course, uh, well, Britain, for example, accepts uh, uh, other Europeans uh, to come and work in Britain. But now Britain has opt opted out of the European Union and it has lost a lot of migrants which uh, serves uh, uh, Britain very well. So problems like this will arise everywhere. This idea that powerful countries uh, should uh, uh, determine how the world is uh, managed uh, without consultation. For example, they decided to have a so-called so Trans-Pacific Partnership. It was hatched in Washington without consulting other countries which will become involved. And we find that it is all in favor of, of Washington. Uh, we didn't want it because it's not in our favor. For example, the provision in this uh, Trans-Pacific uh, uh, Treaty was that if uh, a company loses money in any one of the poor countries, they are entitled to sue the government. And the government can be impoverished because of this uh, action on the part of investors in their country. So because of that, many countries are un they do not believe in the Trans-Pacific uh, Treaty. At the same time, of course, we belong to the World Trade Organization. That is supposed to control the trade in the whole world. But we ignore that each one of us would have regional treaties, like uh, uh, the Southeast Asian countries. We have the ASEAN grouping. And our ASEAN grouping, of course, uh, sometimes uh, have to reject World Trade uh, Organization's uh, practices. So there is a problem there because the WTO was conceived by other people without consulting uh, the people who might become involved. So there are many, many common problems for the world. Now, when you uh, look at the growth of countries from tribal countries where the tribes uh, try to uh, maintain uh, their own freedom, within the tribe, against other tribes. But uh, eventually, that was too destructive. Uh, the, the tribes merged and become countries, states, 
So we have the nation states, but the nation states have to deal with other nation states. There are almost 200 nations in the world, and we have conflicts between them, even leading to wars. But we have not yet come to a stage where there is a world government which has uh, certain international laws that applies to all countries and that all countries must obey the laws. Otherwise, as in many countries, you break the law, action will be taken against you, you'll be tried in court, you may be punished. But when nations uh, break international law, there is no way we can apply international law to the rich countries, to the powerful countries. Uh, if, the, if a powerful country decides that this area is, belongs to them, what can the world do? Nothing. Uh, when China declares uh, that South East, uh, the South China Sea belongs to China, what could the people in the South China Sea area, the ASEAN countries, what could they do? What could the rest of the world do? Are we going to go to war with China? That would be very destructive. So we have no international law that governs the behavior of countries in the world today. The United Nations, of course, is not functioning well simply because five countries have been given the veto powers. It's not a democratic organization. We need an organization for the whole world to deal with common problems that is almost like a world government, a world government which is representative, not a world government formed by the rich countries or the powerful countries, but a world government that is elected from all the countries of the world, represent, representing uh, the, the, these countries, and they can have a say in the formulation of the laws governing the whole world and the, the way the laws should be operated. If we don't have that, then in future there will be more common enemies. Of course, uh, if you read H.G. Wells, he talks about the uh, invasion by creatures from other planets. And the world had to fight the creatures. It's the world against uh, these invaders. It's not just the United States or China or Russia, but the whole world. So we have to uh, learn to, to work as if we are one country. The whole world becomes one country. Govern in the same way that countries are governed under laws which are uh, formulated uh, to, to, uh, with uh, the consultation with all the countries of the world. So uh, this idea that, uh, well, actually the United Nations was formed uh, believing that uh, it will put an end to wars. But you see a war being fought now between Russia and Ukraine. What can we do? Uh, obviously, although the U United Nations may be uh, set up to avoid wars, we find that it can do nothing. Yes, it can apply sanctions, but sanctions hurt other countries as well. How do you punish the re recalcitrant uh, countries? <laughs> so the world must move slowly, of course, gradually by reducing the veto powers and eventually getting rid of the veto powers and the formation of a kind of world government that has the authority and the power to apply laws which were formulated by all the countries of the world. So what I see in the future is a slow merging of the nations as much as we see the, we, we have seen the merging of different tribes in a country to form a single state with a single government. Of course, not everybody will be happy, but uh, I think unless we move 
in that direction, we are going to be faced with common problems which cannot be resolved by single countries. Uh, today we have COVID-19. There is no certainty that we can, we would uh, be attacked by other virus, which uh, other diseases. For example, climate change, it affects the whole world. It doesn't affect just one country, it affects the whole world. And yet each country is trying to tackle the problem by itself. And when it tackles its problem, normally, generally, it will hurt other countries. It may be good for that country, but it may not be good for the neighbors. In fact, it may not be good for the whole world. So there are many, many common problems. Uh, we can define them. Not every, every uh, 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 crime should be dealt by a world government. Many of the crimes should be dealt by the, the country's uh, laws. For example, if you murder a person, the country will take action against the murderer, arrest him, try him, hang him. That is the right of the country. But when the world goes to war and people were killed by the millions, who can stop them? Who can arrest them? Who can put them on trial? Uh, yes, we saw after the Second World War, the winners set our court. This is totally against uh, normal uh, ideas about justice. You have to have a third party that is not involved to be the judge. But here is the party that won the war, became the judge. And obviously, they are going to punish uh, the losing party the losing country, and not themselves. And yet they themselves were involved uh, in a lot of killing, perhaps more killing than the losing party. Uh, just imagine a nuclear war. What would happen if this world goes into war using nuclear weapons? It's not going to destroy just one country. It's going to affect the whole world. And yet we have no means of controlling wars, we cannot, we still feel that um, going to war is a solution to conflicts between nations. It is not. The whole world went to war two times, world war, but it solved nothing. Yeah, one uh, war leads to another war, and now there may be a third world war. So war is not a solution to conflicts. Uh, we see, for example, that in a war, you may win or you may lose. But through negotiation or to arbitration or going to a court of law, you may lose, you may win. The result is the same, but nobody is killed, no damage is done. So human beings, if we can claim, we want to claim that we are civilized, we should eliminate war, make war illegal. So then uh, there will be conflicts between nations, settled perhaps in a court of law, but there will be nobody, nobody would be killed and the country would not be damaged. You see the horrendous damage happening to Ukraine today. And in the end, what is the solution? You expect Russia to say, we have lost, please uh, conquer us. No, Russia will not do that. I think the Russian would rather die than be conquered by others. But on the other hand, Ukraine also is backed by the European Union, which is very clever. They invited Ukraine to join the Euro NATO, but they took a long time. So when the war broke out, Ukraine is still not a member of NATO. This means that NATO need not fight together with Ukraine against Russia. But NATO can supply arms, can supply money, and the Ukrainian will have to fight this war against a huge country like Russia, 
many of the Ukrainian people will die, the whole country will be devastated, but the rest of Europe simply gives money and weapons to Ukraine to fight the war. I don't think that is very fair. It should be that if you back Ukraine, then you should go to war, fighting Ukraine, and that will result in a world war. Uh, currently, of course, we find the uh, leaders of the president of Ukraine and his wife going around the world trying to uh, create support for Ukraine. Uh, the seven countries supported, but the other countries, India, uh, Indonesia, Brazil, refused to commit themselves to support Ukraine. Why? Because they don't like war. Because if the war is fought in Ukraine and is allowed to spread to other countries, then they will also be facing the problems of damage and the killing of their own people. But uh, the force is very strong now to get the rest of the world to turn against Russia and China. Uh, I don't think going to war, confrontation, uh, sending your speaker to provoke other countries uh, is a good way of handling uh, a problem that affects the whole world. So m my view is that uh, we must reject war as a solution to conflicts between nations. And in order to do that, we must gradually merge the whole, all the countries of the world into a kind of world government uh, which is concerned with certain specific areas only, international relations. Uh, because today, uh, travel is so easy, por borders are porous, people will move, and you cannot regard a country in isolation. It has become a part of a bigger union, and that union is the world. In the next hundred years or so, I expect the world will accept that we need a world government. Not in everything, but a world government. There will be local uh, autonomies and things like that, but we need a world government to deal with common problems that affect the world common problems like epidemics, like uh, increase in population, like uh, climate change, and uh, political, uh, political misbehavior, etc. So I will stop there and take your question. Thank you. OK, <coughs> Dr. Mahati, thank you very much for penetrating and provocative analysis. Um, perhaps I could just quickly, before I open the floor to questions, ask you one question myself, which is, um, in this time now when great power rivalry is, is really very serious, do you think there's a need for balancing blocks? And in that sense, can Southeast Asia, and ASEAN in particular, become, is it likely to become more united, perhaps with even a common uh, strategic defense policy? Um, to act as a, a buffer, if you like, or as a balancing factor in this, between these global well, uh, superpowers. Uh, what, what I have, what, what my opinion is about this may not sound uh, very nice to people. I find that the Europeans, by and large, love to go to war. <laughs> you know, they, they fought against Germany as partners between Russia and the Western Alliance, they were partners. They fought against Germany. The moment Germany was defeated, the Western Alliance declared that Russia is the new enemy. So against Russia, they had to form NATO. And when they formed NATO, they became very provocative. They kept on inviting new countries to join. That was all right. But when Russia, uh, which uh, set up the Warsaw Pact, decided to dismantle the Warsaw Pact and let the countries uh, of the Warsaw Pact be free to do everything. The thing that should happen was that NATO also should be dismantled and allow countries to have their own policies. 
but NATO saw the dismantling of the Warsaw Pact as an opportunity to strengthen the opposition to Russia. So they tried to recruit all the ex-socialist uh, countries to join NATO. And uh, they were, of course, very, very selective. Uh, for example, uh, they uh, do not want uh, countries, uh, uh, well, Russia does not want to have countries that is on its border to join NATO. But knowing that, knowing that Russia is against that, NATO actually dangled the, the, uh, the, the opportunity to join NATO to Ukraine, but took time. They, if they had joined, if Ukraine had joined uh, NATO, today the war would be NATO versus Russia. But they took time, and Ukraine, the Russian preempted, attacked Ukraine, and Ukraine had to fight by itself. And the, the solution for Europe is that there should be war. And they are not happy, for example, in, in East Asia, uh, we are not fighting a war. We, are, we have problems with uh, uh, claims by China, for example, but we are not fighting, we are not confronting China. So uh, they have to find a way of provoking China. And the visit of uh, this uh, Speaker of Congress to Taiwan raised the tension. So China, of course, uh, responded by increasing and demonstrating its military capability. And because of that, Taiwan, which had uh, lived, uh, which was quite uh, friendly with, with China, because they have a lot of investments in China. Taiwan now looks upon China as a, as a future enemy and has to rearm. And of course, uh, they buy the arms from uh, America. So um, economically, America gained from that. But what do we gain? Nothing. What we have now is that there is increased in tension in Southeast Asia. And the work of uh, some countries is that countries should fight. Uh, uh, Ukraine should fight against Russia. Taiwan should fight against China. And uh, Saudi Arabia should f always fight against uh, Iran. But it is the Chinese who went to Iran and to Saudi Arabia and told them, don't fight each other, be friends. For 300 years, these two countries have been enemies, and the Chinese were the ones who en en enabled peace to, uh, to be had between the two countries. Uh, uh, enemies. So how do we define this? What do we derive from these uh, events? It would seem that uh, the Western uh, powers wants to see people in conflict with each other and to go to war with each other. Even the Chinese who are accused of all kinds of wrongdoings uh, and all that, the Chinese are the ones who promoted peace. Okay. Uh, in, in their own way, of course, uh, they promoted peace. So we should not allow ourselves to be manipulated by big powers. Thank you. Very forceful answer. Right, let's open the floor to questions from Working Press. Working Press, yes. Please go to the microphone and identify yourself. And please keep your question as short as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Nishimura with Hokkaido Shimbun. Thank you, Dr. Mahatiyo. I would ask about the policy of Japan. And as you, as you know, I think the uh, Japanese government is considering the amendment of immigration law, uh, which introduces uh, stricter uh, norms in the law 
which, uh, which is like such as a uh, three strikes out uh, principle. So do you think that current move of Japanese government will contribute the problem of uh, migration, as you said? And um, what do you say about this current move of Japanese government? Thank you. Mm. Well, um, most countries will accept the fact that people are now more mobile. They can move from place to place. And migration is a, a common result of that uh, ease of movement and porous borders. Whether the Japanese government have a policy to restrict immigration or not, in the future, there will be immigration. Uh, supposing there is a war between China and some other countries, or between Korea, <laughs> and a lot of people are displaced. They have to go somewhere. If they come to Japan, is Japan going to say, please don't, don't come, we don't want you. you, you just cannot. Like Malaysia, we have to accept Rohingyas, not because we like them, but I mean, it is a humanitarian uh, problem. We have to give them asylum. So Japan too will become multiracial over time. Maybe slowly, but over time, whether you have the law or to modify the law or not. Okay, thank you. Yes, you had your hand raised, please. Uh. Selamat pagi, Yang Mulia, Bapak Dr. Mahathir Muhammad, Excellency Mahathir Muhammad. My name is Susilo from Tribune News Compass newspaper Indonesia. I live here for 33 years in Tokyo. Uh, I just want to clarify your words about Indonesia that recently spread out and uh, discussed massively in Indonesia via, uh, via social media also. So someday you said uh, about Indonesia like this. Slowly Indonesian children will be left behind in mastering science. Their life is offered for memorizing verses of the Al-Quran and prayers, learning about the forbidden sins, angels, calculating rewards, looking for argument, and thinking about the afterlife. After being unable to compete, they became enemies to the government and established a Sharia state as a solution for everything. Excellency Dr. Mahathir Muhammad, is that true? You said like that, and if true, what is the real story behind that? Thank you. Yeah. Well, like most countries, we have uh, people with uh, differences in their ideas and their opinions. There are a lot of people in Malaysia who are Muslims, and they tend to follow what they believe is the teachings of Islam. Actually, it is not. It is something else, because Islam promotes peace and good relation between peoples of different race of different uh, religion. That is what is promoted by Islam. Also, Islam is against killing. To kill one person is equivalent to killing the whole of humanity. That is the teaching of Islam. But the people who lead some Islamic groups, they do not follow the teachings of Islam. So we have a lot of problem with people wanting to implement Sharia laws, but not the real Sharia. They are, it's their own interpretation of Islam. What we try to do in Malaysia is to explain to people the true teachings of Islam, that we are a multiracial, multi-religious country, and we have to be tolerant. There is no um, force, uh, no compulsion in Islam. So if we actually practice the teachings of Islam, there would be no problem within a country or between countries. But the problem that arises now is because we have deviated from the teachings of Islam because we want to follow the interpretation of certain people, certain ulama, certain uh, imams and the like. And because of that, today we see uh, what is called Islamic terrorism. It is not promoted by Islam. 
it is just a response to a feeling that they are oppressed. They feel they are oppressed, that the world is unfair to them, and not being able to fight against uh, the big powers, they resort to what we now describe as terrorism. Action taken not by governments, but by actually by groups or by individuals on their own. For example, in France, uh, this man felt angry uh, over what is happening to him and to the Arab world. He just stole a truck and ran through a crowd killing 80 people. It's not anybody's policy. It's not Islamic even. But this is happening now because of a feeling of injustice among the Muslim. But if the Muslims want to avoid injustice, they too should acquire the latest uh, knowledge uh, and to set up good governance. If they have good governance in their country and their country also becomes developed, then the feeling of oppression will be reduced or will be eliminated. In that, in that situation, there will be no terrorism by anybody. Uh, one has to remember that terrorism is not confined to Muslims only. In New Zealand, a Christian uh, person shot dead uh, 50 people while they were praying. And of course, uh, the atrocities committed by Israel is horrendous. They go into the mosque and they kill people while people are praying. Uh, but the world um, does not take any action against Israel. Thank you. Carlton, first, you, you had your hand raised. Thanks, Dr. Mahdir, for coming again to the Press Club and uh, meeting you again, Khadun Azhari. Khadun Azhari, pan Oret News and Arab News Japan. Uh, my question is about the uh, G7 that is ended uh, already two days ago. What is your take on this summit and their decisions? Uh, do you think uh, they will save the world, especially regarding nuclear weapons? Because uh, Prime Minister Kishida selected Hiroshima to host the G7. And uh, in the end, the decision by the resolution by the G7 leaders just uh, kept the status quo that the nuclear umbrella should be kept and we hope everybody will uh, get rid of their nuclear weapons. And we know six nuclear countries uh, didn't participate. So how can you uh, eliminate nuclear weapons from Russia, China, New North Korea, India, Pakistan and Israel if nobody of these countries came to the summit? Do you think that these are dreams or what exactly the realistic approach was taken? Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> when you have a conference of people with uh, like minds who believe in certain groups of countries are their enemies and they make a decision that favors themselves, it's not going to work because the world, as I said just now, is uh, facing common problems. A nuclear war would not only affect uh, the target countries, it will also affect the countries that fire the uh, missile because uh, the uh, radiation will go around the world. So we should actually uh, make uh, well wars illegal, particularly uh, nuclear warfare. But apparently because the decision is made by these seven countries, but excluding China, Russia, North Korea, etc. So they are not bound by the decision made by the seven countries. So the, the, whole, the whole attitude is wrong. If you want to have an, any uh, uh, avoidance of uh, nuclear warfare, you should call all the nuclear powers and the non-nuclear powers, because they too would be affected, to discuss ways and means to get rid of nuclear weapons. But to me, not only nuclear weapons, even ordinary uh, weapons that kill people, 
bombs, ordinary bombs, killed a lot of people. Dresden was reduced to a flat city with uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people dying. That also should be eliminated. So having a meeting of like-minded countries is like talking to yourself. <laughs> You're not doing anything. You're not contributing anything. That is why the other countries like uh, India, Indonesia, and Brazil refuse to, to join in the chorus. Oh, thank you very much for speaking. Uh, my name is Kondo from Kodansha. My question is very simple. Uh, how do you think uh, we should deal with China, which is uh, Xi Jinping's new socialism country? Thank you. Well, um, Malaysia be believes in being friendly with all the countries of the world, irrespective of their ideology. And we have become friendly with China. Our trade with China is very big. And so we want to be friendly with China. If we can be friendly with China, why cannot other countries be friendly with China? But America is telling everybody, please confront China. Please oppress China. Apply sanction against China. What is the response of China? China, of course, will respond in the same way try to fight against, against you, whether it is uh, uh, in the field of technology, for example, microchips, for example, uh, China has got the capacity may, which may be superior to that of uh, the Western countries. It is better that we sit down and try to talk to each other rather than uh, cut diplomatic relations. If Malaysia can be friendly with China, and there is even attempts by Japan uh, to at least converse with China, uh, even South Korea have some dealings with China, we should slowly reduce the enmity that we have for certain countries. As I said just now, the Europeans want to have an enemy. Even their friends, the moment they cease to find their friends useful, they consider their friends as their enemy. That is the wrong way to deal in international relation. Yes, uh, yes, you raised your hand first. Thank you, uh, my name is Yoshioka from NHK World. Uh, I would like to raise a question about the Japan's uh, new security and the uh, uh, defense policy. Uh, the Japanese government is aiming to uh, increase defense budget, uh, obtain counter uh, strike capabilities, also uh, aims to uh, transfer defense equipment with the certain uh, selected countries, what, what we call the uh, like minded countries in Asia. So, what is your view on this? Well, <clears throat> Why is Japan increasing its uh, military budget? The reason is because the U.S. keeps on saying that China is going to attack Japan. If China attacks Japan, not only will Japan be destroyed, China will be destroyed. Just imagine a nuclear war. It will not be just Japan. It will also be China, and even the United States will feel the effects of nuclear war. But the United States' uh, approach to all problem is to send battleships into the area. Uh, they would send, they send their battleship uh, into the South China Sea because China claims the South China Sea as belonging to China. That is the US response. The Malaysian response is, well, we continue to have trade with China. We don't send battleships because we don't have, and we won't, even if we have. So it is the, the manner of your response to provocation that is important. When the United States says that China is, will attack Japan, 
then Japan will have to rearm. Where do you rearm? Because you find that war is a solution. War is not a solution. It will destroy Japan, it will destroy China. I don't think China wants a war because you can kill more Chinese than you kill more Japanese because there are fewer Japanese than Chinese. <laughs> Uh, so I don't think they'll appreciate a war, and they know that in a war, they cannot escape being attacked. But they had no problem with Taiwan for a long time. They, may, they find Taiwan very useful as a source of investment, as a source of technology. But then U.S. wants Taiwan to confront, to be, have a, uh, well, to be very aggressive towards China. So this lady went to, to Taiwan. The result is tension. And Japan now has got to rearm. Why do you rearm? Because you think war is a solution. My answer is that war is not a solution. If you have a provocation, don't respond in the normal way. Try and reduce the provocation. Right. Lady first. Aiko Doden, journalist from NHK, formerly a correspondent based in Bangkok. I have a question regarding the Global South. Um, you have said before that the existing world order is primitive, where countries resort to force to resolve um, disputes. And, and listening to you makes me feel that the world uh, has not moved on as much. Um, you have literally lived through a range of geopolitical shifts from the World War II to the end of it the Cold War um, and the end of it, although some doubt if it was ever over, including the non-alignment movement. Um, do you believe that the so-called Global South, including Asia, have a role to play in defining the, the sort of new world order that you envision to bring about? Yeah, I believe that is, that is an, uh, an alternative. There is one of the solutions. I would like to point out the, the history of ASEAN. You know, when we became independent, we were against each other. Many overlapping claims. Because of that, we confronted each other, and even we had some small wars against each other. But the leaders of ASEAN, way back in the 1960s, 70s, found that confronting and fighting does not benefit the countries of ASEAN. So they decided that the leaders of ASEAN, five leaders, should meet every year and discuss problems and try, <coughs> try to resolve problems by the leaders. And since then, that grouping has increased to 10 countries in Southeast Asia, and for 60, 70 years, we have had no wars between us. We have claims. We have overlapping claims. There are conf conflicting claims, but we did not go to war. We try and meet every year, not only the leaders, but also the uh, administration. They meet every year to resolve problems. Problems like trade, economy, development, and uh, politics even. We try to resolve things around a table, not in the field of war. So if ASEAN can do it, these 10 countries can do it. What, what if the world have a similar arrangement? Every year, the leaders, the top leaders of every country meets and try and resolve problem among themselves around a table. Not threaten each other, not tell to each other uh, that if you don't accept my solution, I will go to war against you. That is not the way. The way is to find a solution. Sometimes you, you find a good solution. There are times when you cannot find a solution. Okay, we'll come again next year and talk again. 
That is the way human, civilized human beings should behave. But currently, in the whole world, the solution to conflict is to go to war, kill people, destroy countries, and you expect everything will be resolved, but nothing is resolved. The enmity still uh, continues. For example, uh, I mean, China and Japan, South Korea and Japan, still talk about something that happened almost 100 years ago. And you keep on uh, formulating your foreign, foreign policy based on something that happened 100 years ago. Uh, that is not being very pro progressive. <laughs> we should think about the present time and the future of this world. Thank you very much. I think we have time for just one more question. Yes, the gentleman here. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, moderator. Uh, Dr. Amati, my name is Sho Kawakita, a senior staff writer of Kyoto News, Japanese news wire service. I have a question about uh, sort of a geopolitical uh, issue, which is the uh, uh, gray zone matter. Uh, we are now seeing uh, a sort of a conflicting uh, situation in the world today. That is the, the uh, disappearance of the gray zone and the emergence of the gray zone. In Europe, uh, we are seeing uh, the gray zone has been diminishing since uh, February 24th last year. Sweden and Finland uh, decided to join the NATO and the Ukraine became much, much closer to the uh, uh, West. Uh, on the other hand, globally, we are seeing uh, the emergence of the gray zone, which is the uh, uh, growing presence of the global south. Could you give us your thought and the, uh, uh, your insight? Uh, are we uh, becoming uh, much more uh, bipolar world, or uh, are we uh, becoming a uh, bi bi uh, multipolar world? Thank you very much. Well, I, I don't believe in a multipolar world. I don't believe in a bipolar world. I believe in one world. That means that uh, we should come around and regard this world as our country. If we can regard the, the islands of Japan as Japan, why not regard the whole world as our country? Because nowadays, problems affect the whole world, not just one country. Uh, so if we, if we are faced with a pandemic, uh, like the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, if America tries to resolve only the, the, uh, the, uh, what affects America, what about poor countries? They are also going to be affected, and eventually they will also reinfect America. So there is a need for one world. There is a lot of talk about one world, one world, about uh, business people think about one world. Uh, business have done well, because they now do business with the whole world, not just within their country. But politically, we still think of different countries and different policies. And worse still, we try to form blocks, East, Eastern Bloc, Western Bloc, socialist block, capitalist block. And when you do that, you mean that you are creating an enemy. And when you create an enemy, you have to, uh, well, beat the enemy, win against the enemy. And that is the reason for conflict. There is no reason at all why America should regard China as an enemy. Because China is much closer to Malaysia and if China does something affecting Malaysia, we will suffer more than America. But America wants everybody to go against China. Uh, Malaysia so far has not committed itself to joining the Western alliance because it means a confrontation and an escalation of uh, military uh, capability. You know, military capability, capability has no limit. The moment you build some new weapon, the other side will build a weapon that will 
uh, negate your, your new weapon. And then you have to build another new weapon to fight. And it goes on, and it costs huge sums of money. Uh, for example, uh, when they develop new airplanes, they come to Malaysia and ask us to buy the plane. We couldn't afford. It's too costly. But they say, if you don't buy, your enemy will buy. <laughs> you see? So we are in a quandary. We don't have the money, and yet the enemy has got... So we strain, cut down on, uh, on uh, other expenditure, and buy airplanes. And what do the airplanes do? Just fly around. Because we are not going to walk. And what, what happened was that the planes that they sold to us couldn't do anything because they did not give us the source code. Without the source code, we cannot plan for any attack against anyone. So we are being um, forced to buy useless uh, weapons uh, simply because uh, the weapon makers, the manufacturers, want to make money. That is behind everything. I think uh, the, uh, the world, a uh, one world government, should limit the manufacture of weapons or the development of new weapons. Then I think we'll live in a better world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahathir. Um, thank you for coming today, and thank you for, I think, what was a sparkling performance. Um, I think you have shown yourself to be every bit as lucid and forthright as you ever were, perhaps even more so with, uh, with aging um, and maturity. Um, okay, well, um, we this is very much hope to have you back again to um, give us more of your wisdom. Um, and let me, as a, a tradition of this club, is to present our guests with our speakers with a one-year honorary membership. Oh. Thank you. Please come back again. Thank you.